this is the Northern Ireland Assembly. I declare the Health Committee meeting open to the public. May I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. May I advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted. Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. Uh, so, apologies. Do we have any apologies for today's meeting? Can I first of all welcome Alan Chambers to the committee and wish John Stewart well in his role working with the Minister. No apologies have been received in the committee office. Uh, can I advise members that I have written to the Minister for Health to accept his invitation to attend the reconstituted Strategic Health Partnership Forum as Chair of the Committee. I will, of course, update the Committee following any meetings. Uh, just to also update the, the Committee that I met with the BMA this week in relation to concerns that they had around GP issues, uh, concerns around the lack of progress on the North West Medical School, and uh, issues arising from pensions, and but they will at a later stage want to brief the committee in, in further detail. But I've done an initial meeting with them on those on those issues. So item number four there, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of February, which are pages 7 to 15 of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Content, thank you. Can I advise members that there are no matters arising from the minutes? Uh, we now have a new agenda item today, the, uh, an update from Chief Medical Officer on coronavirus, also now known as COVID-19. Can I advise members that the Chief Medical Officer and officials from the PHA and HSCB are here today to brief the committee on the situation regarding the coronavirus? Good morning. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer from the Department of Health, Dr. Jerry Waldron, Head of Health Protection, Public Health Agency, and Dr. Miriam McCarthy, Director of Commissioning, Health and Social Care Board. You're very welcome here and thank you for your attendance. And would you please go ahead and brief the committee? Okay. Uh, well, good morning, Chair, Deputy Chair, and members. Uh, just to uh, thank you for the opportunity to come along and give you a uh, a brief, a brief update in terms of novel uh, coronavirus, or as it's now called SARS-CoV-2, uh, as of uh, read uh, classification definition by the World Health Organization. Uh, this has uh, been a fairly rapidly uh, developing uh, situation, and indeed that's been highlighted, and indeed members will have followed that very closely again on the on the media coverage, coverage which I, th I have to say has been very informed, and indeed uh, the public response to that. Uh, media coverage has equally uh, been very uh, measured uh, and balanced. Um, as you're aware, the uh, novel coronavirus has emanated from Wuhan in Hubei province uh, in, in China, but has continued to, to spread uh, globally, and we are currently seeing cases in some uh, 30 countries uh, throughout uh, the world. Um, just by way of background, uh, in terms of coronaviruses themselves, they're a very large uh, family of viruses. Uh, and they range in terms of their impact on human health from things like the common cold, which has a seasonal uh, element to it, to, right through to some of the more severe uh, manifestations of coronaviruses, such as we experienced in 2002, 2003 with SARS, the, the uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and then uh, more recently with MERS, the Mediterranean uh, Metro Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome in, in 2012. Uh, and again, this is very much a new virus, so we're still learning uh, very much uh, about how it behaves uh, and how it presents clinically and the impact that uh, it will have on the population. I think that, uh, I mean, that's an important point because this is not a virus that has previously been seen uh, in humans. Uh, so none of us have been exposed to it before. Uh, and none of us have any underlying antibodies to protect ourselves or to give ourselves immunity against infection. And that's why you have seen the response at both the WHO level and the global and international level to try to contain this virus so we better understand what its impact uh, might be. And until such times as we have effective measures to either treat or to vaccinate at a population uh, level. Uh, you will be familiar with the fact that uh, on the 30th of January, the World Health Organization declared 
uh, the coronavirus is a, a global public health emergency of international concern. And I think it's important to understand that effectively what that means is that at an international level, the response kicks in across both developed countries and underdeveloped countries in terms of seeking to put arrangements in place that would help contain the spread of the virus. So it, it's basically uh, um, allows the WHO and other uh, governments throughout the world to mobilise their resources in terms of uh, preventing spread and eliminate uh, the impact on the uh, population. At that time, and in response to that, as, as UK uh, CMOs, we then advised the respective health ministers across the United Kingdom to, again, raise the uh, risk uh, level uh, to um, moderate. It had previously been at low. Uh, and again, that was to basically indicate that we, too, uh, right across the United Kingdom, needed to be, begin to prepare for a range of eventualities. Uh, but again, important to emphasise that the risk to the population, to you and me, to individuals, at this time, uh, remains low. And I think that, that is uh, an important uh, message. Um, as I said earlier, the WHO has now announced the official name uh, for the disease itself, which is COVID-19. So that's the name for uh, the disease uh, and the respiratory symptoms associated with it. And SARS-CoV-2 is the name uh, for the virus. Um, as you will recall, uh, back on the uh, 6th uh, of February, the uh, Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, which contains all the sort of top scientists uh, right across uh, the United Kingdom, advised us as, as UK CMOs that uh, given uh, some of the spillover into other areas and other countries and parts of the world, that we should extend um, the uh, testing for people returning from uh, those areas to include some other uh, uh, countries. And we did that through a communication uh, to uh, the health service, uh, communicated out by colleagues from the Public Health Agency on the 7th of uh, September. The, in total, there have been, as, as you will have been following, uh, nine uh, uh, confirmed cases within the UK. Now, there have been also two additional cases that have been as, as a consequence of people travelling into the UK. Uh, and all of those individuals are currently receiving uh, mm. specialist uh, NHS care, and indeed some of those people have made a full recovery, and indeed some of those individuals have been discharged. I think that's an important point to make, that whilst it is of concern and distressing that we hear of fatalities uh, in China, um, that there have only been to date uh, two fatalities outside of, of China, uh, and that remains distressing, um, but the vast majority of people have a mild illness and seem to recover fully. 98% of people to date have recovered fully from this illness, but it can be a protracted illness, and we're still gathering uh, data on that. Um, I think it is uh, likely that the number of confirmed cases in the United Kingdom will increase as the contacts of those already confirmed as uh, positive are identified. So there's a very active process of contact tracing because we're in this containment phase at the moment where we're trying to limit uh, and, and delay sustained transmission uh, within the United Kingdom and indeed within these, uh, these islands. Uh, we are using tried and tested uh, infection uh, prevention control procedures uh, to prevent that spread and just again to confirm uh, that to date we've had no cases uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Now, up until yesterday we were not uh, uh, publicly announcing tests that had been carried out. I think the public should take assurance from the fact that we're uh, exercising a high degree of caution, taking a precautionary approach, uh, and testing uh, individuals where there is a, uh, a concern and a relevant travel history or potential contact. Um, we have continued to provide those figures at an aggregate at UK level, and we announced those figures at 2 p.m. Uh, each day. Um, as I say, we had not previously uh, reported the numbers tested in Northern Ireland because the numbers were very small and obviously to protect individuals' uh, confidentiality. We never report numbers when they are less than five. Um, the numbers were reported on yesterday because we clearly are now in a situation where we have more individuals that have been tested and all of those tests to, to date uh, have been negative. Um, I, as I say, just to also uh, advise um, members that I and, and actually colleagues with me this morning took place in a, a media briefing uh, uh, yesterday, uh, because I think it's hugely important that we work with our, our colleagues uh, in the media to ensure that 
They are informed in the reporting, uh, as I indicated earlier, remains inf informed and balanced. And, and as I say, um, they will be uh, very important allies in ensuring that we're communicating important message just clearly and consistently uh, to the public as, as developments uh, continue. I think it is uh, not unreasonable to assume, and as the Minister had previously said, that at some point uh, we will have a positive case in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, we are now one of 12 centres uh, across the United Kingdom that has the laboratory facility to test for the virus. Um, that uh, went live uh, on Monday. Um, and uh, previously, of a few days before that, we had been testing our capability. I think it's important to bear that in mind, that if this virus was isolated uh, and confirmed as a new or novel uh, coronavirus uh, back on the 7th of January, and by the 10th of February, uh, we were testing and able to, and had the capacity and capability to test for the virus. So I think the public should take some assurances in terms of the speed with which globally uh, we are researching, uh, developing tests, looking for effective uh, ways to treat, and sharing all of that research evidence uh, and intelligence uh, internationally via the, the WHO. Um, now, um, as I say, it is important uh, that we have that capacity locally because, again, the, like, the numbers of people we are likely to test is going to increase over time. Uh, and it's important that we're able both to uh, identify individuals who are positive so that we can, again, public health agency colleagues can, in the containment phase, seek to identify potential contacts. But it's also important that we can reassure quickly uh, individuals that they are negative and that there is no uh, cause for concern. Um, just briefly then, uh, as you know, the, uh, the Foreign Commonwealth Office has repatriated 198 uh, British nationals from Wuhan. Uh, they're now in supported isolation in two centres uh, in England. And a number of Irish nationals are also uh, in these facilities. At the end of two weeks of isolation, the individuals are tested. Uh, if the tests are negative, they're uh, absolutely uh, free to, to leave. They've all signed a contract you know, committing to remain in, in, in quarantine until such times as those tests uh, are negative. Uh, and in order to protect individual confidentiality, obviously I'm not able to advise if any of these individuals will be uh, returning uh, to, to Northern Ireland. Um, you will be, uh, know from the media coverage that the Department of Health and Social Care announced the Emergency Health uh, Protection Coronavirus 2020 powers on the 10th of February. It applies only to England. Uh, we, at this present moment in time, uh, at the request of the Minister, are considering whether additional uh, public health legislation may be of benefit in, in, in supporting and adding to our efforts uh, in terms of the public health response. Clearly, we would never want to be in a situation uh, where we would uh, use such uh, legislation, and indeed it uh, would be something that would be considered only as a last resort. Um, just to again uh, advise that ourselves, uh, the Department uh, and the Public Health Agency continue to work very closely with colleagues right across uh, the, these islands, uh, colleagues in the United Kingdom, colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, uh, to ensure that uh, Northern Ireland is well prepared to deal with the situation as events unfold, but also to ensure that we are sharing information and intelligence. Uh, and we are in regular contacts, and I am in regular contact with my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we have uh, established um, operation centres within the uh, Public Health Agency and within the Department, again, just to coordinate the, uh, uh, those regular uh, conference calls and sharing of information that, that is going on. Um, the Public Health Agency are working uh, closely with trusts here in, in Northern Ireland in terms of their planning and prepar uh, preparation. Uh, Port Health. Uh, in terms of individuals uh, travelling airports and the council colleagues in primary care. Um, the Health Minister continues to engage with uh, uh, his counterparts right across the uh, United Kingdom through the uh, regular uh, COBRA ministerial uh, meetings. Also, uh, we are working with the Northern Ireland Executive Office to ensure that we are sharing information and intelligence around uh, you know, the potential uh, impact in terms of this virus should it arrive and when it arrives in, in Northern Ireland and actually what the impact might be in other departments and their respective arms length bodies. I'm happy to return to that uh, in, uh, in the Q&A uh, session. Um, I think just finally to conclude, um, you know, we 
there is absolutely no uh, room for complacency, and obviously mm -hmm. my priority as Chief Medical Officer is to ensure that the, we in Northern Ireland uh, are prepared for a range of event eventualities so that we are best prepared to protect uh, the public. We are at a phase now, well, in terms of the scenarios, there's a couple of things that could happen, um, which is, you know, the, the Chinese authorities have put in place, uh, you know, ex extremely extensive public health measures to seek to prevent the spread of the virus beyond uh, China. So the two scenarios we're likely to see, possibly see, is that uh, we have uh, the uh, spread of the virus predominantly within China, with a little bit of spillover, as we're seeing at the moment, into other countries. Uh, but that we don't see sustained transmission in those other countries because of the public health intervention that they're taking to try to contain the virus and contact individuals who've been in contact. Uh, the other scenario is we're not successful in doing that and the virus uh, spreads um, uh, throughout other countries and globally. And we use terms, and you remember from 2009, we talk about the term pandemic in that situation. That doesn't mean anything other than the virus has spread globally. It doesn't mean that the virus is more severe um, but other than the fact that it has spread uh, throughout the world. Uh, at this stage, as I say, we're in the very important phase of containment. So that's the, the work that the public health agencies do day and daily, and you never hear about it because uh, it never happens. The consequences of their uh, uh, contact tracing uh, individuals, you know, whether it's meningococcal disease or other things or food poisoning, contacting individuals and preventing the onward spread is something that they do. That's their bread and butter. So we're in that containment phase. We will then look to uh, how we delay this further, and we happily talk about some of the things we could do there in terms of what we are doing in terms of ports, um, uh, airports, things such as social distancing, some things we might need to consider. And sometimes those things don't necessarily follow the things you might think might help a delay the spread don't actually so and there are trade-offs there so we need to consider those um, and then we're, we're obviously need to be very actively researching you know I say there's much we don't know understand about this virus um, so we need, do need to know you know uh, what is the severity of it you know what actually are the number of people uh, who are at risk of severe disease and potential death and and what are the characteristics of those individuals um, what you know looking at our existing a battery of drugs that we have for antivirals and whether any of those would be effective uh, against uh, this uh, a virus. Uh, and obviously, um, in the uh, medium uh, term to longer term, research is ongoing in terms of developing an effective vaccine for it. Um, and then, as I say, if this does become, uh, and we do see sustained transmission within the United Kingdom, then obviously what we need to do is mitigate the impacts of it, and that means you know, mitigate the impact on the health service. You know, obviously our health service is already under under pressure, so we just need to think about how we best mitigate that impact, and also how we begin to consider how we might, in those circumstances, mitigate the impact uh, to people, keep people well, healthy, and, and ensure that it doesn't disrupt uh, too much of our our normal uh, lives. So, as you can see, um, a lot of that was us speculating about the future because we have to plan for all those eventualities, many of which may not happen. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that's the, um, the, the difficult issue at this point in time. We need to plan and prepare for all of those things that could happen, but at the same time, our effort is concentrated in ensuring that none of those other things that I've mentioned uh, just now actually happen. And there's a fair chance uh, that with the efforts we're putting in place, that some of those uh, consequences may not actually occur. So, Chair, I'll, I'll close. I'll close there. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you mentioned there, uh, Dr. McBride, about <coughs> SARS COVID two versus COVID nineteen. Can you explain that a wee bit further? What the? Yes, um, I mean, I, I, I don't think any of those are going to stick. If I'm honest, because I think uh, you know they, there's been so much coverage in the media about this novel coronavirus that I think you know in common language. I mean, I find it very difficult even to adopt the new terms when a new virus uh, uh, emerges. Uh, and I think it's probably you know when we think back on this. Um, there, there can be a, quite a stigmatising ef effect of new viruses and new infections, and sadly we have seen that with this virus as it emerged in terms of the association with parts of the world or association with particular communities, and that is deeply regrettable, but unfortunately does occur. Uh, so the, uh, a bit like, uh, I suppose, uh, storms, um, and we had um, 
um, Storm Kira recently, the WHO has a system whereby they will uh, look at new emerging viruses and, and almost give them um, anonymised names, not linked to a particular country or region where the virus emerged, but actually um, uh, something which they understand, but none of the rest of us really, uh, really need to understand. So COVID-19 is the name of the illness. So all that stands for is coronavirus, CO, uh, VI is just virus, and D is disease. So it's coronavirus disease 19, because that's the year uh, it emerged in, uh, 2019. Um, and SARS, uh, COVID-2 is just, it's very related to the SARS virus, but it's, there are genotypic differences. So it's related to, but different to uh, the SARS virus. And from what we know at the moment, uh, it would appear that you know, SARS had quite a significant case fatality rate. This virus does not appear at this time on the basis of the information that we have to have uh, that same case fatality rate. So in other words, it, it seems to cause less severe disease in the vast majority of people. So, and I have a few indications from members, but given, given that connection with SARS, does that make the search for a vaccine easier or more difficult? And is there any sort of projected timelines around that development? An, an excellent question, because a lot of work was carried out in 2002, 2003, uh, uh, because concern then arose around coronaviruses as a family. Coronaviruses uh, um, predominate in bats, but it can be found in some mammalian species, uh, and indeed SARS moved from bats into civet cats and then jumped the species from the civet cats into humans. So it's quite likely what this virus has done is, again, we're not certain, so this is again uh, me surmising, has, may well have crossed uh, the species, you know, the uh, wet markets where there are um, livestock, uh, wild animals sold along with um, other uh, products sold in, in certain uh, countries, that the virus may have potentially jump the species from bats into a mammalian species and then on into humans. So from that time in um, 2003, uh, tests were very rapidly uh, developed for testing for coronaviruses, and there's been a lot of ongoing research. So again, it was a matter of uh, once the Chinese authorities shared the sort of genetic makeup of this virus, which they did very, very quickly, and again, we had uh, it shared from colleagues in, in Brisbane as well, they were able to adapt the tests that have been developed uh, for SARS and MERS very, very quickly to test for this new virus. Uh, and equally, there has been work going on um, since then to develop vaccines against uh, coronaviruses generally. Uh, and obviously, that then accelerates our ability to, to begin testing candidate vaccines uh, for this uh, new uh, virus. But again, I would just add on that point that that's likely to take many months. And if this does uh, become established, uh, and we do see sustained community transmission, we, are, we would not have a vaccine for this wave of the infection. That's why the, the public health messaging, in terms of what people can do to uh, protect themselves and protect others, in terms of that catch it, bin it, kill it, uh, what we are currently doing, and public health agency colleagues are doing around the containment, is so crucially important. That delays things, it buys us time, it helps us better understand the virus, it helps us uh, research better what treatments might be effective, and actually allows us to better prepare for any consequences. Okay. Thank you. Do we have members indicating in the order of Jerry, uh, Pam, Alan, Sinead, and Arlea? So, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Michael, that was useful. Just a, a couple of quick questions. I mean, uh, and just one observation is my assessment of people's opinion on this seems to be outright dismissal and overhyped to panic and some of that leading into racism and conspiracy theories as well. Um, imagine the sort of the truth is somewhere in between where we need to keep an eye on it, we need to monitor it and respond um, as best as we can if it does uh, escalate, hopefully not, but if it does. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, what are the, the warning signs in terms of people's health uh, that they need to keep an eye on in terms of if they potentially are uh, protracting it? Could you maybe comment on that? Um, and how well equipped do you think we are um, currently? Obviously, if it escalated, we'd have to um, escalate our response. I don't know how we do that, but maybe a, a comment on that, how we do that and how equipped we are. Um, and just kind of following on from the Chair's point, um, uh, do we, is, it, is it your understanding, uh, Chief Medical Officer, we need a vaccine to deal with this, or is there 
a, a concern or a belief that it may be something more to tackle this. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a question in, in regards to that. I, I'll, I'll, t- I'll take the last one first, and then uh, the issue in relation to health and presentation and mm-hmm. that side of things. Uh, I'd ask, ask to, to Jerry and then on to Miriam about the sort of the preparation within the health service and the mitigation, etc., in terms of consequences. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of vaccines, um, as I said, uh, and other treatments, um, we're not starting from a zero base on this. You know, we have cupboards, and I sorry, I use the word cupboards, uh, you know, just by well of uh, an illustrative purposes of other antiviral drugs. So we have antiviral drugs that we use for um, uh, seasonal influenza, for instance. We have antiviral drugs that we currently use for some of uh, some other viral infections, such as HIV, um, and viruses sometimes share very, you know, common. Uh, characteristics, both in terms of the virus, the uh, enzymes that they use to insert themselves into human cells or or to cause the ill effects that they cause. And we have developed a range of other antiviral drugs, which what we're actively looking at, I know the Chinese authorities are, we're actively looking at, is whether we can repurpose uh, existing drugs, which obviously then speeds up the entire process, because you're not sitting in a laboratory developing a new drug using artificial intelligence to look at surface markers and design, or you might block entry into cells, but you're actually using existing drugs, which are tried, tested, demonstrated to be safe, and you're trying to see whether those drugs would be a benefit. So that actually gives us a head start. So again, just to reassure you that all of that research is ongoing at the moment. Vaccines, I think probably we will very quickly in the next number of months um, move into uh, animal testing of uh, new uh, candidate vaccines. Um, And it would be fair to say, however, that we need to balance the um, desire to develop an effective vaccine with ensuring that whatever vaccine we uh, develop is actually safe. So there are quite uh, strict processes, as you will understand, to ensure that we protect the safety of the public. Uh, there are accelerated arrangements whereby we can fast track vaccines uh, if, if there's a situation such as this. Uh, but as I say, it's crucially important that what we don't do is, um, you know, and we need to bear in mind that this is a, an illness which to date, you know, 98% of people seem to make a full recovery from. So we need to be careful in terms of the development of a vaccine that the vaccine we develop is entirely safe. Um, Jerry, on the okay. Thanks very much. And, and uh, I think the the other two parts of your question was just looking at the signs and symptoms and the level of preparedness we're at at the moment. I think you quite rightly said that you know we've got to tread a balance between complacency and hysteria, if you mm-hmm. like, in, in terms of getting it there. And I think the people that need to be concerned at the moment and need to be contacting us and getting medical advice, a very small group of people. Mm-hmm. And we look at the case definition, there are two parts to it. Mm. One is in terms of travel and people who have travelled from the specified countries within the past 14 days. So that needs to be present. The other one is the symptomatology, the symptoms. And they're respiratory symptoms, principally a high temperature, cough, shortness of breath. Now, if someone has fulfills both of those conditions, they should be seeking medical help. And the important thing that we're saying to people in that position is that they shouldn't be pitching up at their GPs or pitching up yeah. in medical facilities, they should pick up the phone, get in touch. That's a really important message for people. We have. Get in touch with PHA? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, PHA. Yeah. Yeah. With a 24-hour um, helpline. You the and there is a 24-hour uh, helpline, and we can, we can give the, the numbers been, has been uh, quite well publicised. But just to emphasise on all of that, at the moment, as Michael has said, we're in a phase of containment, and the no, we have no confirmed cases in Northern Ireland yet, and... The, um, the, the numbers of people likely to be affected is still quite small, but it's very important that they're identified at an early stage, which will prevent, if, there are, if, if they are actually carrying the virus, it will prevent it going any further. The general bulk of the population who have respiratory symptoms and haven't travelled to any of these countries are okay. Mm-hmm. They don't need to be seeking help in relation. Now, they may have other conditions, and they need to be getting the normal medical help and advice for those conditions. But in respect of what we have to call COVID-19, and I'm getting used to, to, to saying that word now, um, they shouldn't be alarmed or concerned about it. But, but people 
who fulfil the case definitions should be seeking medical help and advice as quickly as possible so that we can identify them and we can give them further advice in terms of, of what they need to do. Now, the second part in terms of preparedness, um, this is new. This is a new situation we're in. It it's, it's, has aspects that we're, we haven't seen before, but it's important to say that we've been in other situations mm. like this before. Mm. We were here in 2009 with um, H1N1, more commonly known as swine flu. Mm. We, had to, we had to deal with that. We had to set up similar, though fortunately not, um, not as intensive, situations when the West African Ebola yeah. um, condition was, situation was there. We had to, even though it was unlikely that, that someone with Ebola would come into Northern Ireland, we had to put the, the, the systems in place. So they're all tried and tested syst systems. We have um, an emergency plan, what we call a joint response plan between uh, public health agency, VSO and, and the Health and Social Care Board. <laughs> that we have activated, we activated a few weeks ago, we've got those systems in place. We are dealing with the containment phase at the moment, we're in constant touch with the trusts on a daily basis, and because guidelines and guidance are updating every day, and we have to keep everyone up to speed with, with the changing situation. Um, so we are, we are managing very well at mm. the moment in terms of where we're going and in terms of and 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 you know i really would like to pay tribute to our colleagues particularly in the trust and in yeah. primary care yeah. who are who, who are you know they're, they're pretty much overworked at the moment but they have responded very very well mm. and uh, to this because they recognize as well where we're at in terms of the threat and to ensure that as long as possible we keep this out of northern ireland and, mm. and we do have but we're also looking forward to the other scenarios. Mm. What will happen if we get, maybe when we get, a confirmed case? What do we do then? We know we have the plans for how we deal with that. Where we go in terms of contact tracing? And thinking even further forward in terms of if, if we ever get to the stage where this is uh, beyond containment, get to the stage within, within Northern Ireland, how are we going to cope with that? And we're moving forward in terms of making plans and, and establishing procedures and processes for doing that and preparing for that. So it's just, it's, it's, it's changing all the time. And I think what we have to do is, is keep abreast of the changes and be ready to adapt in terms of our response as, as the situation changes. I mean, just before we hand it on to Miriam, just very briefly, so I think just to reassure, if you know, the other thing about delaying this, containing this, and delaying this, is that we get out of this season at the moment, because you know everyone's coughing and sneezing, mm -hmm. and because there's a lot of respiratory illness around, and if we could, if if we get to the situation where this is circulating within the United Kingdom, and we're a long way from that at this point in time, then it'll be easier for us in the health service and clinicians to identify individuals. Um, you know, who have respiratory symptoms and potentially might need to be tested because, uh, you know, at this point in time, it's, it's, it's difficult and tricky. But the vast majority, is, is, uh, and I think a very important message there is the general public at this point in time should not be concerned about respiratory symptoms that they have. You know, it's again those who have a relevant a travel history or a contact history with the, the symptoms. The other thing to say is, um, you know, what we're trying to do is to prevent this a virus, virus that circulates and continues to circulate. Mm -hmm. uh, many viruses emerge, and then you know we have a really important opportunity now to sit on this mm -hmm. and stop this becoming a virus that circulates every year on an ongoing basis. And that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. Again, we don't know what the impact is going to be like, but you know, at a point in time, we will have treatments, we will have vaccines for this new virus, but we don't really want to get there. We actually want to stop it in its tracks. It's much easier to stop an epidemic in its tracks at an early stage than to let it get established, and that's much harder uh, to, to stop. I think the other reassuring thing I would say is that the history of coronaviruses generally is that, and there's no evidence that this virus has changed. That's another important thing since the first virus was detected in, in, in China. No evidence it's changed in any way. But over time, coronaviruses generally tend to become more easily transmissible. And we know this virus is more transmissible than, than flu, for instance, but chen tend to become less virulent. So in other words, they cause less severe disease. So that's the natural history of coronaviruses. We don't yet know if that's how this virus will behave. But sorry, Miriam. 
Okay, so the <clears throat> other area you were asking about was our um, ability to respond. And I suppose one of the first things I would say is Jerry has mapped out the pathway for people who think they may be at risk of being infected, their travel history plus symptoms. So that's an important element. Um, and one of the first things that our health service is doing is being crystal clear about how to respond to those people um, and test them appropriately so that they are not in contact with others. So, for example, all general practitioners know the protocol and where they should be making contact by phone and arranging the testing. And every one of our trusts have made arrangements to ensure that people who require a test are tested in an area separate mm. from the normal busy front door ED of the hospital. Yeah. And some of them are actually considering, and we'll know the case uh, tomorrow, um, investing in what we're calling pods, in other words, a sort of prefabricated area that will be truly separate. So they are absolutely clear that they have a clear protocol for separation of people arriving at what are, we all know, busy hospitals. Mm -hmm. And a number of trusts have actually tested that. You know, they've walked through and see what would happen if somebody turned up at the door. So that's a really important step because we're still, as I think CMO and Jerry have emphasized, still in containment. And the service can help to support mm -hmm. that containment by making sure there isn't inappropriate contamination or spread. So that's the first thing where we're really <coughs> focusing efforts to ensure that that is crystal clear. And we are in regular contact. In fact, we speak to the trust every day. So we know what's happening um, and we're assured that that is the case. Then there'll be a second phase um, and that will be really for the trusts and indeed primary and community care, nursing homes, etc to consider what if this does become a circulating virus and what if a number of people are affected and we need to respond as a service to the increased demands associated with that. So we will have a number of weeks, hopefully, before we might, hopefully we'll not get to that position, but we have a little bit of time, but we are not being complacent. We are acting now to put those plans in place and as part of our board agency response, we have established what we call a surge subgroup. And surge just means dealing with increased demand. And that group involves primary care colleagues, um, secondary care colleagues, those involved in the planning of services in the hospital, and importantly, community-based care. And let's not forget nursing homes and that private sector element. That group are looking at this stage at three key areas. One is acute care. We all know that our acute beds tend to be occupied and busy, so we need to think about what do we do to help respond to demand in that respect. There's also a group looking at critical care, intensive care capacity, is often one of the highly mm. specialised services we really need to look at in detail. And certainly this was the case at the time of swine flu in 2009, where I can recall being involved in daily conferences looking at exactly how our beds were being utilised across every single trust. And I have to say trusts flex up and flex down critical care beds every day of the week. It is their normal business. But if we were to see an increased demand, there will be an, an absolute increased focus on how they manage that capacity. And also we need to look at how we could expand that capacity fairly swiftly? Do we identify additional beds in other areas of the hospital? Um, and that's a possibility in theatres and recovery areas. Do we train more staff? Do we prioritise the cases that are coming in to be dealt with? So there are a lot of questions that are being posed and which we will be doing extensive work in the next uh, couple of weeks, including meetings tomorrow, to really look at that uh, element of detail. And then the other key area within that planning is about maternal and child health. We need to ensure that maternity services, then that obviously they have to continue no matter what, and our paediatric services um, can respond. At this point, my understanding, I will refer to the experts of CMO and Jerry, is that children are less likely to be affected 
but again, we do not consider that there's any scope for complacency. We have uh, 12 paediatric intensive care beds, and we need to ensure that we have those that, if we need it more, we can provide and utilise more. So we are not excluding the paediatric population, even though it looks at this point that the risk to children is less. But I suppose that, like all things, could change. So we're taking forward quite a body of work, and we're doing it in conjunction with trusts and primary care colleagues to really have robust plans in place that allow us to expand. At this point, we don't know what that demand may be, but we need to be prepared for an increase in demand over a period of time, and possibly sustained, as CMO has said. So that work is in progress and will continue. And just to say, you know, that's our planning. We hope we don't get there, but obviously it, it would be it's responsible that we plan and prepare for all eventualities. As I say, what we're endeavouring to do is make sure that that scenario, those pressures, those, you know, that mitigation phase, which is you know at the long, at the end of a long list of the response, that, that mitigation phase that we don't get there, and, and how successful we are in those earlier phases, of course, important. I mean, I think either way you look at it, uh, and I think your point about public messages is crucially important. So, um, you know, the, as I say, that we will be planned, we will be ready for whatever the eventuality is, um, and I'm sure at some point in time you'll have me back and you'll be saying, well, did you do enough early enough, or did you do too much uh, too soon? Uh, and the truth of the matter is, what we have to do is actually ensure that we're just ready to flex up, flex down, depending on how the situation emerges. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, I think it will be very reassuring for everybody, not yeah. just in this room, but um, in, in the rest of the province, to be able to um, access this um, mm -hmm. public information. So that, that's very good and very reassuring. Um, just a couple of things. Um, one would be, I would ask you if um, you'd be very clear about anybody who does think that they're at risk or that they may be uh, showing some type of symptoms that they're concerned about, that you give very clear direction today on what they do, because we know what people will do. Is yeah. They'll go to ED and they'll go to their GP, mm. and I know that's not what you want to do. So that would be the first point, if you'd make that very clear, and also um, give us a helpline number. Um, and yep. the other thing was just uh, you'd mentioned the possibility of additional um, legislation that may be required mm. um, and if if you could just tell us a wee bit more about that and tell us what that process would entail and any um, probable timetable for that yeah maybe if I I'd let Jerry pick up on the uh, clear direction because I think you're crucially that's a crucially important message to come out of, of today's session in terms of what the advice is and the the helpline for travelers or those who think they've been in contact and, and your assistance and help on that would be greatly appreciated in terms of legislation um, the uh, legislation that was a, a, a introduced um, uh, on Monday of this week was in relation to providing uh, the Secretary of State in England, uh, not not uh, ministers here in Northern Ireland or in Wales, powers to uh, detain against someone's will uh, for the purposes of isolation and uh, for the purposes of testing uh, for this virus, as long as and until uh, and when such uh, measures were still uh, of benefit in terms of limiting spread. So th they are quite ex extensive uh, powers. I have to say. Uh, from a public health perspective, and I'm speaking as a doctor, and uh, those are sort of powers that we would never wish to be able to exercise. I think what I would also say is, as has been demonstrated by the 198 people who have, with dependents who have returned to date, that those have not had to be used, and that the vast majority of people in situations like this, as we've heard from the media interviews of individuals who have been in supported isolation, uh, those who have uh, actually uh, been discharged uh, from hospital, the vast majority of people uh, are responsible, do the right thing, want to do the right thing, and will continue to do the right thing. Um, and I, you know, we will look at whether or not we feel uh, that such legislation, um, and our minister will consider and, and engage with the committee and executive colleagues, if indeed we feel such le legislation would be of added benefit in protecting the. Uh, public, but the second thing is whether it's proportionate 
or whether it's not. And I think those are things which we are considering. Um, in terms of then uh, additional uh, further legislation, um, uh, you know, it, it may well be, again, as part of our planning, um, we may need to think through sort of the consequences if indeed we don't contain this virus and if it does uh, uh, start to um, get a foothold uh, within uh, the community that trying to provide the services that uh, Miriam has indicated uh, along with uh, staff sicknesses and absence uh, is something that we will need to manage as well. So in those sorts of circumstances, we may uh, need to look to, for instance, extend the pool of uh, individuals, and that might include some retired staff, for instance, who are still you know, recently retired, who have the skill set. So those are the sort of scenarios where we may need to look at relaxing uh, certain uh, requirements uh, so that we can actually ensure that we provide continuity of care. Now, those are in the sort of extreme situations, and I, I give that as an example. I, you know, I don't think we're going to get to that point, but I, those are the sorts of things that we will be thinking through in terms of any <coughs> legislative change, any relaxing of existing legislation that would allow us to respond in a more timely way to, uh, to, to mitigate the consequences of, of the virus if, if, if it were to, to gain a, a foothold and we're seeing sustained transmission. So those are the sorts of things, but we're not, we're in the early sort of stages that just at, at this stage. And uh, as I say, those are things which we will be actively considering in the, in the coming days and weeks. So just for clarity, no, there's no, there's no timeline in place because you're still very much at consideration of whether it, it would be appropriate or... There's or ongoing con consideration, yeah. Pam, just to confirm, yeah. there's ongoing active consideration of whether there is additional, you know, those areas uh, where we would require additional legislation. And obviously, when we become clear as to what that ask would be and the vehicle, what the legislative vehicle might be and how that might be progressed, then obviously that's something that we would absolutely uh, wish to discuss with the, the committee and also the executive as necessary and as appropriate. You know, we're still in a uh, consideration stage and, and looking at elements of that to ensure, one, that's comprehensive, and two, that we go through appropriate processes. Yeah, yeah. And just a comment on the, on the powers that have been addressed in England. And I know, obviously, most people uh, will absolutely will behave responsibly and be sensible, and we've heard yeah. you know, yeah. interviews from people who have you know, suspected um, coronavirus and, and how well people do behave, but obviously there there will still be there will be quite a few scenarios of people who may be suffering other health conditions where it's actually beyond their control to to, um, That's, yeah. to make that sensible decision as well. So I think it, it is still worth considering You're, that yes. there may be times, and we know yes. there are you know people who wander out of facilities and Indeed. out of buildings because they're they're not under law they're not supposed to be detained and that's right but actually for for their own health sake sometimes that's not the best way yeah. so i suppose there is no, no you're absolutely right i agree that I mean, in terms of that capacity to make those decisions and judgments an individual can be uh, impaired for a variety of either underlying health reasons or transient yeah. uh, issues which can, can impair judgment just in terms of the uh, i'm sure you mm -hmm. know the advice mm -hmm. clear consistent cogent advice and the helpline number? Absolutely. Uh, do you want me to give the helpline number? Yeah, I think that'll yeah, be good. Sure. Um, <laughs> right. And just to outline who the helpline number is for. Absolutely, yes. The helpline number is 0300 200 7885. Now, it is, because I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, it's a quite a small group of people we're talking about at the moment. So really we're looking for the people that, to, that should be phoning the helpline are people who've travelled. Yeah. And whether, whether or not they have symptoms, I mean, that's the, the, they might still wish advice in terms of where they've travelled. So if they could phone up, people worried about it, people should know, most people should know, well, I haven't been to that place, therefore yeah. I haven't got it or I shouldn't have got it. So that's important. Now, we, I think the point that you made as well is, is, is a very good one. It's a point we've been emphasising, certainly in the media briefing yesterday, in terms of getting the advice to the people concerned that they shouldn't be going directly yeah. uh, to seek medical help. That's been in all the advice we've been putting out. We have posters that are uh, available and that they've been in for, for various settings, whether it's port <coughs> health, airports, A&E departments, GPs, 
uh, surgeries, though it's probably a bit late at that stage, but, but anyway, uh, it's there, it's on our, our PHA website. They can, the posters themselves can be downloaded from our website for anyone who wants to use them. Um, we're going, uh, we, we had a, a bit of a moratorium on social media because our colleagues in Public Health England were telling us to do that, but that stopped. We'll be putting more out through the Public Health Agency social media channels. And if I could be a little bit cheeky and ask you, uh, could you publicise it yourself through your own um, channels and websites and whatever, so that just getting the advice out there that yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, it's getting the balance right at this stage, but so that people know where to go. Yeah. Number one, they know where to go if they, there's a number to go if they're worried about it and, 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 and uh, they need further advice, but also if they do meet the case definition, the message that they should stay where they are and phone for advice and assistance is really, really important because we don't want them going into, into situations where they, they could be putting people at risk of, of catching the virus. Now, inevitably, people are going to pitch up at a GP surgery or pitch up an a and &E, and that's why the advice that we're giving both to secondary care and primary care emphasises what to do when this happens. So early identification of people with that travel history, so they'll be asking about travel history pretty much straight away uh, and isolating them on the premises immediately so that until further advice about testing can be taken. So we, we've thought about all those scenarios, we've given advice about those scenarios and from um, anecdotal feedback that's being put into place when, when people, people are presenting or people are phoning about with the symptoms. And Jerry, in terms of the travelling, are there identified regions available yes. for people, or can you give us them, or yes. are they available? On? Absolutely. And, and this is something that was changing since the beginning. Was first of all, we were only talking about where the part of China where this this actually came about, which was Wuhan city, and it expanded beyond that to Hubei province, which is the province in 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 China where Wuhan is is, is the principal city. Uh, then it moved beyond that to mainland China. And more recently, and this was specifically because a number of countries were identified which were hubs in respect of travel from China. And these countries are, um, as well as main, mainland China, it's Thailand, Japan, the Republic of Korea, um, Singapore, Malaysia, and associated in uh, Taiwan, and um, Hong Kong and Macau, which are part of China but not mainland China. So all of those were added on. So it's it's a lot of it's 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 a lot of additional countries. And because of that of course we we're seeing a lot of potential a lot more potential cases when the um, you know when we're just looking at mainland China because a lot more people as you can imagine will have will be travelling to and from those countries and if they're symptomatic and they're common symptoms will they'll need to be checked out to ensure that, that they're not um, carrying the virus. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to Alan, Sinead and Alea. Could I just ask members to keep questions as brief as possible, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr McBride. Uh, just to, to add to what the, the Deputy Chair has said, I'd like to commend your department for the work that you have done to date and certainly what has been reported and what we've heard this morning should give reassurance to the public. Um, just uh, it, the long-term um, outlook uh, for this disease, it, is it, do these diseases um, do, do they suddenly go dormant uh, as quickly as they appear, or, or is it uh, a vigorous worldwide vaccination program that eventually uh, brings control to it? Um, in terms of research, I'm sure there'll be a lot of research uh, right around the world going on at the moment. Uh, is that research coordinated by the World Health Organization rather than everybody sort of paddling their own canoe, as it were? And uh, just the third question, in terms of a patient presenting uh, with symptoms and uh, the, the, the GP decides it's necessary or the hospital to conduct the test, how quickly do the results of that test come back to give reassurance to the patient that they don't have that virus? I leave. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll deal with the first uh, three there, and maybe leave. The, or sorry, mm. first two, and leave the last one then to to Jerry, if I may. Uh, the answer is we don't know with this virus because they're all different. Uh, if we if we compare uh, with, with SARS, for instance, SARS appeared towards the end of 2000. 
and two rapidly peaked um, in around April and then you know disappeared. I mean, obviously, this virus has infected more people and caused more deaths worldwide. And uh, although SARS had infected the sort of affected the same number of countries, so we need to bear that in mind. So again, you know, SARS, uh, you know, largely disappeared and went dormant, uh, and that was without specific treatment. So at this stage, it's fair to say we don't know. We don't. There's lots of things about this virus we don't know. We're increasingly understanding a little bit better about the incubation period, i.e., how long it, it, it is for you acquiring the virus to developing symptoms. Uh, there's been some reports. I think it's worth. Sorry, I'll keep my answer short as well. There's some reports uh, in the media about asymptomatic transmission that you may have picked up on. There is no evidence that you know people can carry viruses. Uh, but there is no evidence at this stage that this virus can be transmitted when people don't have symptoms. The vast majority of coronaviruses, people are most infectious when they have the symptoms, i.e. when they're coughing and sneezing. So, uh, but, and what we don't also know is whether this virus, if we don't contain it, will have some sort of seasonal variation, a bit like we see with flu. So if we don't contain it, the possibility is that this might be a virus which um, you know, it may sort of peak fairly quickly and die off, or indeed it may be a virus which because of all the containment efforts and delay efforts, that actually becomes a slower burn. You don't see the same peak, but it's around for a while. Um, and that will allow us time then to get this, the second element of your question, is, which is where we develop treatment and we develop vaccines, and then we can get the virus under control. But our desire at this point in time is to stop this new virus getting a foothold, because if it does, it could be a virus that we then need to start checking for. For instance, every, every, uh, you know, every time somebody presents with a respiratory virus, we will be checking for flu and other things, RSV, and we may end up checking for that, for this new virus. We don't want to be there. Uh, in terms of research, again, there's been uh, huge efforts globally building on SARS, MERS, uh, Ebola to set up coordinating arrangements all under the umbrella of the WHO. So there are agreements uh, between all member states, agreements between international bodies to share research. For instance, there is um, an agreement at this point in time, all the research that's been uh, carried out globally at this point in time, that authors of those research papers are sharing that pre-publication. So there is no delay in that information getting out to others working in the field. And the example I mentioned about China very rapidly sharing the genome of the virus once they isolated it, Australia sharing it, and that allowed colleagues uh, in the public health agency to very rapidly develop a test. So I can assure you that um, that global effort um, is, is coordinated, it's continuing, and everyone's committed to it. Thank you. And in respect of the timing of the of the tests that you, you, you asked as well, I mean, it's it's very impressive that we've had the test so soon. It's even more impressive we've been able to get it locally yeah. so quickly. And because we have it locally, generally we can expect the results of the test within 24 hours that has been taken. It used to be a lot longer than that when we had to send it to, to England and, yeah. and with transport and everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have Sinead and then finally earlier. Thank you. I um, appreciate that. And, and I genuinely do find it very reassuring. And it puts some perspective um, when we talk about the 98 per cent of people that recover from this. So, and, and I think it's worth repeating just to keep that perspective whenever we do ask even questions about it, because it is in that context. Um, I, I was um, going to make the same sort of query around testing, and that 24 hours is also reassuring. And I'm thinking of the link up between, whilst there may be good intent behind us sharing very openly the helpline number, I wouldn't want it um, to be coming under pressure yeah, yeah. in terms of the resource exactly. that's there, that it is targeted to mm. those people mm. who have travelled. And in that vein, I'd like to ask, has there been specific public information directed to people travelling from those countries at their arrival point? Because no doubt they could arrive either via England to Dublin or to Belfast. Yes. And that helpline number would need to be targeted mm -hmm. to the people who it will work for, because it wouldn't have the prefix for somebody arriving in Dublin, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I understand there's a lot of filtering out there in order to make sure the resource is there for the people who need it. Yes. Um, another point I would like to make, you know, you mentioned the testing of isolation units, and that's most reassuring. But I can also imagine a person uh, arriving at a hospital. It must be quite alarming 
So it's good to know, you know that that's what's happening and people shouldn't be, because visually it mm, must look yeah. quite alarming, but people should be reassured by it rather than um, perhaps scared of it or, or concerned. Mm. And, um, and another question I have, and it may, it may sound um, odd, but it, it runs through my mind when you were talking about the actual um, trying to the, the, the build up or, or the shared um, coronavirus linkages from previous viruses. And I wondered about the vulnerable groups in society who we encourage every year to take a seasonal flu jab. Mm. Now, there may be amongst that group, as there is every year, um, a certain number of people who did not take up on their flu jab. And is there, mm. is there any suggestion, or maybe it's a myth, that the flu jab may have some shared antibodies that, whilst would not be, obviously, in any way um, a vaccination, but it could it potentially have the possibility of reducing the severity of the attack or the, um, the medical outworkings of, of somebody who has been infected? And is there, therefore, if that was the case, is there any merit in making an additional call out to any vulnerable people who there would be every year mm. um, to take up that seasonal? Are they connected or can we bust that myth? Well, I, I maybe make a very brief comment on that and hand over to Jerry and we'll take those in reverse order. Maybe okay. um, the, What you do not want is to have co-infection you know, that you have seasonal flu plus this on top of it. I mean, that has to be avoided at all costs. And the message must be uh, to individuals who are eligible because of their age or underlying health uh, problem to go and get your flu jab. You know, uh, the Public Health Agency has been continually to promote that message. I think during the early interviews that were around this issue, that message was reiterated. You know, if you're eligible and there's an offer of flu vaccine, go and get it. And why would you not want to protect yourself uh, and also, why would you not want uh, to protect your family? And similarly for healthcare workers, you know, protect yourself, your family, but most importantly of all, protect those who you're providing care for. Uh, so you're absolutely right. In terms of whether there's any protection, uh, no, there's no read across in terms of the antibodies that it would uh, stimulate. But obviously, if you can avoid having two infections simultaneously, and we know that one of the I mean, people do. I mean, people die of, of flu, seasonal flu, every year. You know, about eight thousand people, maybe across the United Kingdom. Um, one of the problems with seasonal flu, people get complications, get bacterial infections. So you really don't want to get seasonal flu, and you certainly don't want to get seasonal flu with this on top of it. Sorry, yeah. Jerry. Yes, I th I th and I think that's 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 a very good point because um, this is still relatively rare. I think all the normal public health messages yeah. need to go out. <laughs> it's really important that people should be getting their flu jab anyway, yeah. whether right. this is you now. The, 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 the co-protection probably isn't there, but it's a good idea. And similarly, the messages we've been putting out about catch it, bin it, kill it apply to respiratory yeah. conditions. Important to carry uh, a packet of tissues around with you. I've got mine here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, it shouldn't be forgotten about. It's really important. Now, you mentioned about airports and messaging at airports and, and things, like, which, is, which is important as well. In the early days, Public Health England was... Uh, was active at Heathrow Airport because that's where the mm. where where the flights from from direct flights from Wuhan were coming into. Mm. They've expanded that out into other airports where there are main flights from from the other areas. Within Northern Ireland, we haven't got direct flights, but there are flights coming into Dublin. Right. And it's an important point you make as well about our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland that we've got a very good working relationship mm. with. Uh, what they have done. In, at, in Dublin Airport in respect of the messaging from Northern Ireland is they are publicising our helpline mm -hmm. with the information that if you are travelling to Northern Ireland, here's a number to phone. Mm -hmm. So that information is going on. Now, we've, we've got slightly different definitions, which caused some problems, but we're dealing with them. Uh, and we're, we're, we're always in, in contact. We're working together, sharing the information. Uh, across the border, as 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 we would, because viruses don't recognise borders, and I think that's an important thing to to, to remember. So uh, you know, we're do, we're doing what we can in in, in that respect. Hello, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and just to follow on from the point that that Sinead and Jerry had made there, it was around the um, 
the the planning um, across the island. Um, I know that you had mentioned earlier around the, the surge subgroups and um, obviously the different robust plans that you have in place if and when they're required. Um, but it was just uh, maybe to ask if you are content that the planning island wide is robust enough because, as you just said, Jerry, of course, if the, the infection does spread on the island and it's a big if, yes. mm. we're all on the one island. So, how will the two health systems, I suppose, mm. even work in, in a harmony with the border mm. um, areas and all the rest? Maybe just some clarity on that. Viruses don't recognise borders, sure, mm. they don't. No. Right. <clears throat> and we have already, I mean, in a number of service areas, we will work very closely with our colleagues yeah. in ROI. And that's a, that's part of normal business. And on this particular matter, we have already had yeah. numerous contacts with colleagues at the ROI to explore what their facilities may be, um, and that will continue. And it will be, I would expect, proportionate to whatever issues are emerging as part of this. Um, we do, however, need to recognise that if it does become more prevalent, and we experience increased demand mm. here. They too may yeah. be experiencing increased demand. But as far as possible, we work with colleagues in Great Britain mm -hmm. and with colleagues in ROI, and we'll continue to do so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, members, um, and thank you for coming along this morning. Out of what I know, and we all know, is it has to be a very busy schedule. We really do appreciate it. I think we also feel significantly better informed in, in terms of the issues surrounding all of this, so, so thank you for that. Uh, on behalf of the committee, I want to wish all of, of the agencies and the minister and the department that are dealing with this all the best in the time ahead, and the frontline staff, who obviously are the, the, the front line in terms of containment and treatment of, of, the, of the disease. Um, and just to let you know, that the, the committee will assist in any way possible and as appropriate. Where, where and when needed. And obviously, just to conclude, thank you and thank you for your, your attention this morning. And obviously, we will endeavour to keep sure we keep the committee updated as as, as, as things develop or not. Uh, so, as I say, that's a, a commitment from the minister and from ourselves to, to do that on an ongoing basis. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, members, we'll maybe now take a short <laughs> for break. We had talked about plenty, maybe 15 minutes in, run slightly over 15 minute break. I'm back here for 20 past. Yeah. Yep. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chair. The department officials are here today to brief the committee on the departmental budget. I refer members to pages 18 to 30 of the pack and to the clerk's memo at pages 3 to 6 of your table papers. Can I also advise members of the department have advised us of a minor error in table 3 on page 30 of your pack, which refers to a table 4, which is not included in this paper. So, I would like now to welcome Nelia Lloyd, Finance Director. Hello, Nelia. David yep. Keenan, Financial Planning Unit. Brigitte Orth, Director of Investment D Directorate. And I hope I've got that name pronunciation correct. Bridget. Bridget, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. And Linda Carter, Head of Capital Resources Unit. So, I just ask the uh, officials to please go ahead and brief the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm going to provide the opening remarks in relation to the resource budget, and then I'm going to hand over to Bridget to provide the opening remarks on the capital budget. You will have received our briefing on the 2019-20 resource budget position, spring supplementary estimates, and the 2021 resource budget forecast requirement. I would like to draw out some of the key points in these opening remarks for you. In terms of 2019-20, the Department received an opening resource budget settlement of £5.6 billion, an increase of 3.8 per cent against the comparable funding levels in 2018-19. Now, whilst the Department of Health received a measure of protection compared to other departments, this funding was not sufficient to maintain existing services and a significant funding gap remained. Historically, health and social care cost pressures have been increasing at a rate of around 6 per cent per annum primarily owing to an ageing population with greater and more complex needs, increasing costs of goods and services, and growing expertise and innovation, all of which have resulted in increased funding required each year just to maintain our existing levels of service and meet demand. This gap of around 3 per cent between the funding and the increasing costs has been met through a combination of savings 
and in-year slippage, together with an increasing reliance on in-year allocations through monitoring rounds. This is far from ideal, as it requires that the Health and Social Care Service makes those reductions that can be achieved within the timeframe of the current financial year. A challenging target to deliver £77 million of savings and other measures in 1920 was set, as referred to in paragraph 8 of your briefing paper. As noted, the Trusts have, in particular, struggled to deliver these savings this year and identify and implement recurrent savings measures. The target was to be achieved largely through cost controls or low-impact savings measures. The latest forecast indicates that against their target, the Trusts are delivering around £23 million, and none of this is expected to be recurrent into next year. Some £42 million of non-recurrent slippage has been made available to the Trusts in order to support them towards financial balance or to live within a resource control total set by the Department. The medicines optimisation target of £20 million is expected to be exceeded by some £12 million, largely as a result of efficient procurement of medicines, targeted interventions for cost-effective prescribing and costs of medicines lower than budgeted costs. The over-delivery of this aspect of the savings target has been important in supporting the delivery of overall financial balance. In addition, the Department secured non-recurrent funding in 2019-20 of some £86 million through the June, September and January monitoring rounds. This funding, together with a number of technical adjustments and funding in relation to the increased employers' pension contributions, has resulted in a budget of some £5.87 billion. Paragraphs 15 to 21 of your briefing paper provide you with details on the spring supplementary estimates, which have been prepared based on the opening budget position for 1920, as subsequently adjusted through the in-year monitoring process. The spring supplementary estimates are the final stage in the 1920 budgetary and legislative process, with the presentation of the SSEs to the Assembly for debate and approval later this month. The Budget Bill NI 2020 is to provide legislative authority for the Executive's revised spending plans for the 2019-20 year as a result of in-year monitoring adjustments which have taken place since the main estimates were approved in Westminster in October 2019. It is also worth noting that while the Budget Bill NI 2020 does also include a vote on account to allow departments to continue spending into the early months of the 2021 year, this does not constitute setting a 2021 budget. The Assembly's authority for the expenditure against the 2021 budget will be sought through the main estimates and associated budget number two bill in June. The Finance Minister is in the process of holding bilateral meetings with each of his executive colleagues to discuss the 2021 budget. And this will provide an opportunity for some discussions on the timing of the Westminster Government's upcoming budget and its implications for the Executive's budget process. Turning then to the Department's 2021 resource budget forecast requirement, I think it would be helpful if I took you through some of the key figures within the paper. The Department is currently anticipating a significant funding gap in its 2021 resource budget, as the current £5,758.8 recurrent budget baseline will not fully meet the forecast costs of maintaining our existing services. A summary of the 2021 forecast funding requirements is set out for you in Table 1. The top half of the table indicates the forecast expenditure requirements for 2021, and the starting position for that is the 1920 forecast funding requirement. We have then factored in both new inescapable pressures to maintain existing services and new decade new approach commitments, which results in a total expenditure requirement of 6.49 billion. The bottom half of the table sets out the funding sources. The projected total funding requirement to maintain existing services and meet new decade new approach commitments is 661 million pounds. This includes the Executive's commitment of £170 million pounds to, in relation to pay parity and safe staffing. So the Department requires a £492 million increase 
on this year's budget to meet the inescapable cost of maintaining existing levels with no growth in transformation and meet the agenda for change pay award and safe staffing levels. In other words, this is the minimum additional funding requirement of £322 million, referred to at paragraph 31 of your paper, plus the £170 million commitment for pay parity and safe staffing. The absolute minimum additional funding requirement of £322 million <coughs> assumes that £72 million of savings will be made across health and social care services in 2021. This includes a £20 million target for medicines optimisation and a 1% target for trusts. This will represent a challenging savings target, given the increased demand and the scale of the financial pressures faced. It is also not without risk given the level of recurrent savings expected to be delivered in 1920 against the 77 million savings target, as I mentioned earlier. It is expected that the trusts will identify more recurrent savings over a longer time frame. Indeed, longer term financial planning and service planning could help move trusts away from so-called firefighting of short term pressures and assist them in developing longer term and better value for money solutions. To deliver the health and social care commitments in New Decade New Approach would require a further £169 million of funding, as set out in paragraph 35 of your briefing paper. Therefore, the total projected funding requirement for 2021 is £661 million. I will now hand you over to Bridget, who is going to talk you through some key aspects of the capital budget. And I'm going to start by passing this jug of water down to my colleague David, who I don't think has managed to get any yet. Um, but thanks, Neela. Um, again, I thought it would be useful to talk you through some of the key points in the capital section of the paper, which I think starts on at paragraph 51. Um, so the first two tables there um, give you some background on our budget over the last five years. Table one is a breakdown of the movements in our budget, and table two shows the key elements. Moving on to the aim of our programme, we're looking to facilitate the delivery of modern, fit-for-purpose services through the provision of appropriate infrastructure. Our ability to transform the way we deliver our services is directly linked to the level of capital resources available. Um, and over the last number of years, our capital needs have been considerably in excess of our budget allocations, and we have had to constrain our programme to match budget availability. And that has led to a gradual deterioration of our existing facilities and a lack of investment in the modernisation that's needed to support changes in service delivery. So our existing programme needs to balance the prioritisation of our ongoing major projects, some of which are highlighted in the paper, um, with the need to maintain our existing infrastructure. Looking to the future, over the last year, we've been undertaking some long-term capital planning, um, working with our stakeholders in our arm's length bodies to develop a draft 10-year programme for the period to 2029-30. Um, the work completed to date has been used to inform the information we've provided to the Department of Finance on our needs, and these are set out in Table 3, which is just above uh, paragraph 72. Um, the subtotal of this table um, is taken just below what we regard to be our critical needs, which does include a number of new projects where redevelopment really can't be delayed any further. And as you can see, this shows that we would need just over 300 million to meet our needs in the financial year 2021. Beyond that, the numbers increase, and it's clear that 300 million won't be sufficient in future years to meet these needs. <coughs> Neela and I would be happy to take any questions you might have on the paper. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I suppose one of the first questions that occurs to me is um, in relation to the detail that's being supplied in the paper. So, it's quite high level uh, in terms of what the what the spent needs are. Can you give us some more breakdown in terms of the different areas that you plan to spend, such as mental health, and how you plan to increase that level of spending? So, can you bring, break those figures down for us into sort of areas of work? Okay, from the resource budget perspective, I'm very yeah. happy to, to lead on that. Um, so, what we factored into budget 2021 in terms of forecast expenditure. Um, are new inescapable pressures as set out in Table 2 of your briefing pack that really are those um, increases in costs and the types of areas whereby they are deemed to be inescapable for next year for which we will require extra money. 
Um, you mentioned learning disability and mental health, the mental health in particular within that um, has a figure of £20 million set against that as being an inescapable pressure for next year that we would need to, to meet in order to be able to continue to deliver the services in behind that. Um, the, the key aspect also of the inescapable cost pressures is, is the pay angle and the, the, with £160 million factored into that as well. Um, so, on top of that, and that's where we focus on our maintaining existing services, so that doesn't include any service developments or any additionality for want of a better description. That is simply to kind of almost stand still where we are today. And then beyond that, the new decade, new approach, um, there's a number of commitments in that for health, which um, are factored into the number of work that um, you have here today, which all have um, funding um, consequences associated with them. And um, the estimated cost pressures are set out, which will enable, if the funding is achieved um, or established, to enable those to be taken forward next year. But I still have no sense of how much is spent in mental health, how much is spent in social care. W was there a more detailed uh, breakdown of the figures provided to the, to the finance? The figures that you have here today are very much absolutely uh, in tandem with the figures that we provided to the Department of Finance. When we do our financial planning for a future budget year, we, um, our starting point for that is always the year, the current year that we're in. So, for example, for 2021, our starting point has been what we expect our forecast expenditure to be at the end of 1920. And that's almost our baseline starting position, if you may, or if you will. And then on top of that, we identify what above and beyond that we need to continue going with the services that we have on the ground. So the information that you have here um, is absolutely the same as what we have provided Department of Finance. We've been working with those colleagues for a number of months now in terms of our financial planning, and we've been informing them of the scale of the pressures, and they're very much um, on a similar basis to this. But I mean, if there's a preferred level of detail that you would wish to see, that I'm very happy to consider um, and, and take that forward. Well, I think I think we would like to see more of a breakdown in terms of because. We can't assess how much we're spending on mental health or social care or cancer if we don't know what's being planned for, nor can we decide how appropriate those levels are, how you're going to increase those <laughs> as, as needed. So I do think that we would need some further breakdown. It's very hard to get a sense from these figures of where the money goes. So um, the other thing is I had noticed that the minister said that there's a £169 million required for additional to, develop, to deliver the new deal, new approach document. Um, do, does that figure include the figure for the development of the North West Medical School, and how much is that within the 169? Shall I take that one, Neil? So there's a resource element to it, but if I take that and then I'll pass it over to you, Bridget. Sure. Yes, it does include um, revenue funding within the £169 million. Pounds. It's a very small amount for 2021, but notwithstanding that, that um, is, is likely to have a lifespan of something like 25, 25 million, I think it ramps up to in, by year 10 in terms of a resource requirement. But for actually in 2021, the figure is very, very small. Thank you. And on the capital side, I suppose because it's a further education project, the capital spend we would be expecting to be factored in by the Department for the Economy on the further education side, so there isn't any capital factored into the figures for that. Yeah, okay. I think just, just to just to set out the in terms of transformation, in terms of dealing with GP provision west of the ban, and indeed dealing with the locum and the, and the amount of money that are being paid out to agency staff, I think it's crucial that that, that project is, is moved ahead. Final question from me then is in relation to the 1.06 million that was allocated by Conor Murphy as Finance Minister for those who have been affected by the contaminated blood inquiry. Can you outline what plans are in place to ensure that that full money goes? to those uh, people in, in this short period allotted to it? I can outline from a financial perspective um, the £1 million that we received in January monitoring. Um, there will be um, full utilisation of that money. And what you'll also see in your pack is a reference to a further £1 million sitting within your 2021 inescapable cost pressures. And that's obviously to reflect on the fact that it's not a non-recurrent issue, but actually it, it goes into another financial year. Um, but there will be £1 million provided to those 
people within this year. Is that correct? The million pounds will be fully utilised within 1920 in the current year, based on the money that we got in January monitoring. Um, how exactly that will work in practice and um, what will go to um, those that are affected will be a separate policy area. But from a pure financial perspective, um, I can say that the million pounds, um, all efforts will be made to have that spent fully in the current financial year. Okay, well, I just will note that we have received an assurance from Richard Pingali at an earlier briefing that this would not be used to fund core services for those victims, that, th that this would be used to, to bring them parity yeah. with, other, with other areas. There is absolutely no plans to use that for any other core services. That is okay, I now invite my question from members. We have allowed about 45 minutes for this, so I would encourage members maybe to ask a maximum of two questions, and if there is time, we can take a second round. Um, so I have a couple in already. I have Pam, and then Arlea, and then Paula. So Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I was going to ask about the the, uh, the infected blood payment. So that's that's good for clarification. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Um, could you just um, talk to us a wee bit more about the um, the the budget process? Um, obviously, the the move towards a three-year budget is going to be a very welcome. Um, uh, from next year. Um, could you tell us a bit more about long term budget planning, forecasting, and, and consultation as we move towards that three year budget budgeting period? Okay, so for budget 2021, it's a single year budget period, so our focus has very much been on that one year planning period. Um, so we we focus have been focusing very much on that one year. Um, as I said, you know there's an absolute need for um, financial planning to be on a much more longer term sustainable basis to to enable us to both operationally and financially plan to deliver our services on a more sustainable way. Um, multi year budget period would absolutely permit us to do that, and we would then be looking at not spending all of our money in the confines of a single financial year, but looking. Um, at um, how it's a sustainable um, pattern of expenditure through one, two, or possibly three financial years. Okay. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Earlier. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for the um, the, the update. Um, I just wanted to um, ask another few questions in and around the um, the proportion of the budget um, that's being set aside for mental health. Um, and I'm conscious that the minister and the department have an, a never-ending list of, of issues that you have to deal with, and it's always about trying to balance these things. But I just want to ask the £20 million, um, that's referred to um, in Table 2. First of all, it's in with learning disability. If someone could maybe just um, explain why learning disability is in the same category as mental health. And then the £20 million, um, you had just mentioned there that that would be to continue to deliver current services um, or services as they are. So the, the, the percentage spend on mental health in the North is in around 5%. Um, with that £20 million, is that hoping you where we're staying at the 5% and there's been no increase on mental health spend at all? Um, I know in our committee papers there was a paper from the NA Affairs Committee, um, and in their report one of the recommendations um, was in and around increasing the, the percentage spend on mental health, um, and then it referenced the gap between here and England. I think is up at 13 per cent, and obviously the issue of mental health. I mean, it's everywhere at the minute, and I know the minister himself has come out publicly, um, you know, to, to, to show his support for it also. Um, so it's just to see, is there, are we sticking to that in and around the 5% spend, um, or is there any hope of increasing that? Um, and then just furthermore, I know it was mentioned in the new decade, new approach around the 2.7 million for the mental health strategy and action plan. Is that, I'm assuming that that's separate to the Protect Life 2 suicide prevention strategy, which I know you're probably talking in and around 3 to 4 million. Has that been factored into the 20 million, or again, is that further additional money? Um, and then there's also important business cases in, in, in the system around the perinatal mental health and the Hollywell um, Hospital. So again, um, it, it just seems a wee bit bleak, and I know that the system's under pressure, and, and I understand that. Um, but it's just, if you can clarify, are we still at that in around five percent, or is there any hope of trying to lift some of these projects and get some, you know, get some um, additional spend into our mental health services? Thanks. 
Okay, again, I'll pick up on the resource aspects of that. Um, a number of things there. Just to, first of all, your reference to the twenty million. Um, we describe that as learning disability and mental health services because what that's referring to is additional funding to support, for example, um, some specific examples would be children due to transition to adult services, adults whose family care arrangements break down, complex discharges from hospital. The learning disability element of that relates to the cost of resettlement um, in terms of the complex discharge patients. Um, so that hopefully helps with the 20 million part of the question. You're right in terms of mental health wider than that. New decade, new approach has very much a commitment in there around mental health strategy and implementation of an action plan. And the figure that we've put into um, our forecast expenditure requirements for 2021 is 2.7 million. Um, that can be broken down into the work that will be required and the costs associated with that to develop the mental health strategy, and in, which is the first action in the mental health action plan. And on top of that, um, there is further um, expenditure required to, for example, look at perinatal mental health services um, to um, put in new networks and, and, and things like that will also require further 2.3 million within the 2.7 million. Um, in, in more global terms, in terms of mental health, um, the, the figures that um, I'm aware of in terms of um, 18, 19 and 19, 20, the, the, the mainstream funding, the, the kind of total expenditure that's, that's spent on that programme of care is sitting at around £280 million pounds, um, of expenditure. Um, I'm also aware that um, confidence and supply funding was provided to the Department of Health um, in 1819 and 1920, £10 million, pounds, and that is also being spent on a variety of mental health services um, in terms of that. And on top of that, in 1920, money has also been provided from the um, confirmation, confidence and supply, sorry, um, the transformation funding. Mm. So there's a number of different funding streams. We we'll see just on that, sorry, um, because the confidence and supply and even the, the new decade, new approach commitments are additional. So uh, th when we're, we're talking um, in the context of the health department's overall budget, um, are we still sitting on that 5 6% um, figure of spend on mental health? I think when we take into account the, the, the sum of the parts, um, I think you probably are sitting, but I would, would like to prefer to go back and just check okay. that that is the absolute position for the, the latest financial year that we would okay. have the programme of care analysis. So I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Yeah, if, if just will you come back to the committee with that figure yes. because that is that is a key figure. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you, um, Paula. Bridget, um, sorry. Wanted. Oh, sorry, yes, Gavin. No, I was just sorry. going to pick up on the, the Hollywell yeah. um, comment. I mean. You'll see in Table 3 there, we've um, some figures there for mental health design fees. Um, the department had given a commitment um, in the absence of the minister to progress um, the Hollywell Mental Health Facility into the future. Obviously, that's subject to the minister confirming that he's content with that direction <coughs> of travel. But our proposals that we've put to the Department of Finance have got... Um, design fees for Hollywell um, to go forward next year. Obviously, that also assumes that we, the budget settlement will allow it. Yep. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I have two, two, two questions. The first one is quite, maybe quite simple to answer, and that relates to paragraph three, where you talk about the resource budget of uh, 5.6 billion does not include money for transformation, <laughs> EU exit, and pensions. Why are pensions in particular not included in that budget? It's just the way we have expressed the budget at that particular point. Um, we did get money in two tranches. In 1920, we got budget cover. Um, we had um, some money in our opening budget settlement. Um, the figure was 74.3 million. And then during the course of the um, 1920 financial year, we secured the balance that we were required to fully meet the increased um, employer superannuation rate, which increased by some 6% on the 1st of April 19. Okay. Um, and the second one's maybe slightly more complicated. Last week we had a presentation on waiting lists, and when I asked them about the conversation they had had with the independent sector, for example, around an estimation of how much money it would take to um, use the independent sector to clear the, the waiting list, um, they said that they had not had contemporary conversations with the independent sector, for example, to, um, to come up with that figure. I'm concerned, for example, in paragraph 50, there's the talk of some of the transformation projects. Um, one, of, one of the lines is around review of stroke services, the breast assessment centres. 
My understanding is that the consultation process and the responses to it have not been signed off, and that there are still ongoing discussions and assessment of those two particular issues, for example. How do you know how accurate those figures are in terms of your estimates for the year? Because they could draft, but what the outcome from the transformation process could change drastically based on what the Minister actually decides he's going to do under those two elements. And so, first of all, it's the veracity of the information you're getting that you're putting that in. And then, how, how then can you be sure that if money's set aside for these transformation projects that may not materialise in this year, that you're not then starving ser services for existing projects which really are needing it and are having to find budgetary cuts? Okay, so the, I think you're referring to the £150 million that we have identified under New Decade New Approach Commitments for Transformation Funding. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a number of elements within that, and they are um, you know, picking up your point around you know, um, the robustness of the figures. Um, the figures are uh, actually done um, at a sort of high level estimates of projected costs um, for 2021 and you know, further work, you're absolutely right, is continuing in the transformation space um, subject to um, future decisions being taken. But at this point in time, we've been able to identify that the, the figure would be £150 million, pounds, which would cover a number of things going into 2021, which would cover both the sustainability of existing projects that are on the ground today and those under new decade, new approach <coughs> that are required to continue to transform the health service. Thank you. Um, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Um, just some points of clarification, um, particularly looking at the resource tables under table two and three. Um, I note elective care waiting lists. You have an estimate there of 30 million, and yet in the new decade, new approach, it refers to 50. And I am wondering, is that, and it's similar to um, an earlier thread, is that an additional? So there will, um, in effect, be 80 uh, million put towards that. And just for clarification, the 150 million um, referred to in that excludes any capital. This is purely resource. Yeah. And I also note um, under safe staffing, um, you have an allocation there of 10 million. And I would be just curious to know that 10 million, is that to be directed at, um, I suppose, recruitment and trying to bring up a staff, uh, staffing level, or is that in year expenditure which will be committed to agencies to just cover an immediate pressure? Okay, picking up on your query around the elective care waiting list and the two figures that you've mentioned. Yeah. They are two different and separate figures, and they're both additional. So the £30 million pounds is an estimated cost requirement to address those that are on the red flag of the really urgent waiting list. Mm -hmm. The additional £50 million then on top of that, under New Decade, New Approach, is to address the commitment that was given by the executive in that document. So it is £80 million pounds in 2021. Um, you're picking up then on your other point in relation specifically to safe staffing and the £10 million, pounds, again, a new decade, new approach um, commitment. It was also a key commitment in resolving the industrial dispute. Um, we have £10 million pounds factored into our expenditure for 2021, um, and it's in relation to delivering care. Um, it's the nurse staffing in Northern Ireland is the agreed policy direction for formulating safe staffing for nursing and midwifery. Um, and there's a piece of work that's absolutely being taken forward by policy colleagues within the department in relation to what that £10 million will be needed to do. Um, and that's very much work in progress at the minute, but it ties back down to the new decade, new approach. And of course, it's con the ability to deliver upon it is contingent on actually receiving the funding associated with it. Gemma. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're all aware of the, the high cost of reliance on agency staff. Um, is there any progress um, on plans to reduce agency spending? And the other question is, in paragraph 33, um, it says that say, there's going to be savings or cost reductions of £77 million. Pounds. Um, can you highlight how that's going to be made or any plans of how that's going to be? Okay, just picking up on the agency staff costs, um, and you're right. Um, you know there is significant expenditure in agency and bank nurses in particular um, to ensure that safe and effective services are sustained. I mean, obviously the Bengoa report and the health service transformation is is key and critical in terms of changing the model of care in that. Um, so we are very much aware um, um, of the, the pressure points there, 
and um, the Park Minister is really as committed to tackling the issue of rising agency locum costs across the health and social care, whilst ensuring obviously safe and effective services are provided. Um, a key factor, ultimately, will be the need for long-term investment in our workforce, um, which ties in with, with the safe staffing um, for, for a moment ago. Um, sorry, the other question you had for me there was the... The savings of £77 million. Okay, so in 2019-20, the savings target has been set for, um, as, as you've said, of £77 million. £20 million pounds of that was in relation to the Medicines Optimisation Regional Efficiency Programme, and approximately £50 million pounds was um, set for um, trust to deliver savings. Um, as you referred to them in my opening comments, they were at low um, impact um, cost control measures, bearing down on costs to enable those savings to be met. Um, and um, as I said in my opening comments, that there has been some um, amount of savings delivered in the current year, but it's accepting that they haven't been done in full and they haven't been done on a recurrent basis. Uh, I think it's important also to just to say, set against that, why there might have been under delivery for the trusts and some of their particular savings targets. The over delivery in the medicines um, optimisation programme has helped to offset the gap that otherwise would have remained. Thank you. Thanks. Just in relation to that question, what confidence can you have in the overall figure if the trusts are only identifying 23 million out of the 50 that they were set, and it's non-recurrent? So how can you then rely on that figure for budgeting? The figure that we um, for 1920, if I focus on that particular financial year in terms of um, managing our budgets and living within those, as we're absolutely required to do, um, the figure of 23 million is what the trusts are saying we were able to deliver um, in total for this year through a range of, of cost savings measures, but we're not going to be able to repeat that next year. However, um, one of the key planning assumptions um, for 2021 budget has been um, to factor in an element of savings and a target of £72 million for budget 2021, notwithstanding that. It is a challenge, um, but I think it's absolutely where we, we, we have to be in terms of um, having a target to ensure that services are as efficient as they can absolutely be, um, and particularly given the backdrop of a very, very challenging public sector-wide financial position. Thank you. Um, I now have uh, Alex, and then I'm going to Jerry. Alex. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, £77 million pound savings. Um, you've identified 54, which there's a shortfall of 20... 23. So where's that going to come from? The shortfall um, of where it's been achieved just purely within the savings target envelope has been partly offset by the um, achievement of some non-recurrent slippage or easements in 2019-20. Um, I think the figure in your paper is 42 million has been identified in year, which partly addresses the gap that you've identified there in terms of the 77 million not being fully achieved. And that £42 million um, has been identified just through a number of, um, if, I call them, if I use the word natural slippage, through maybe delays in um, procurement or <coughs> delays in uh, projects being up and running versus what the initial expectation might have been in terms of timings. So the £77 million has been found? Oh. Yes. Uh, um, would we be able to get a, some sort of paper on... Um, the breakdown that each trust has had to save from that? Sorry. The, the money that the trusts had to save each <coughs> in the savings. You want to say a breakdown of which the trust was in which each the trust had to save, yeah. Yeah, I can take that away and give that some consideration and see if that's something we'd be able to get pulled together for you. That's um, great. My last one, you need 600 billion, 491 or something, for next year's budget. Have there been any initial discussions with the Finance Minister yet on trying to get that? We have worked, um, from an official's perspective firstly, we have worked very closely, as I said, with the Department of Finance colleagues now for, for a number of months. And um, they're absolutely um, fully aware um, of the, the, the level of the pressure and the additional funding requirement that we have. <coughs> um, and I know that um, I mentioned in my opening comments that there is a series of budget bilateral conversations being had um, presently. Um, so Minister will be having those conversations with um, the Finance Minister um, imminently. 
and um, we'll be able to then absolutely have a conversation around the scale of the gap, the scale of the, the funding pressures for next year. Um, but I think it's important to note that the um, Department of Finance are very much aware of, of the scale and the, the gap that we're facing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jerry? Uh, apologies, Mr. President. Um, just two quick questions. Um, I think it's 140 million uh, over two years in savings. I think the 75 that Gemma mentioned, I think it was a 72 projected savings for 2021. Uh, um, so, just <coughs> a clarification on it. I think you said slippage. Uh, could you just expand upon that? What that is? Um, is that just projected costs have came down? Um, is that frontline services? Is that uh, staff? Uh, just a quick expansion of that. Uh, and also the IVF treatment, I think it's 8.1 million. Um, just a clarification, I think it was um, there was obviously a debate on Monday uh, about this. That's 8.1 million. Is that all allocated to private um, clinics uh, or is there any of that being ring fence for expansion or the uh, enhancement of, of sort of uh, in-house uh, treatment for, for IVF treatment? Okay, I'll take your slippage point first, if I may. Um, really, when I refer to the figure of the 42 million of non-recurrent slippage that was made available in the current year to support a, a balanced position, in general terms, natural slippage would kind of emanate from two main sources. Money is not allocated to service providers, or money is allocated to service providers, for example, trusts, but not capable of being spent, spent sorry, as initially had been anticipated. So, for an example, um, an example I could quote would be in the area of um, the revenue consequences of capital expenditure. If there is a natural slowing down on a particular capital program, then that in turn has a knock-on consequence for the um, resource funding requirements and expenditure. Um, so that would be a, a, an obvious example by way of where we would generate some natural slippage, and um, where there is a, a slowing down from a previous anticipated position. Um, I hope that answers your question sufficiently. Yeah, yeah just uh, I think it's useful uh, for Alex's <coughs> point to get the breakdown of that because it's a it's a big figurehead, and I think members here I think don't know where the detail of is of that. So I think uh, a breakdown of that would be would be useful. Okay, and <coughs> other question the then in terms of the idea. It's again on a new decade, new approach. The figures that we have in uh, area 0.1 million pounds um, costs associated with taking forward that commitment. Um, that estimate is based on the current funding of 750 women per year to access fertility treatment, um, and it includes um, funding in terms of the extension of the eligibility criteria. Um, so it really is in terms of the work that the regional fertility, fertility centre will be taking forward to address that new decade, new approach commitment. Um, and just as a follow-up to that, that figure, that figure to provide three full cycles was costed out by the department last year at I think 3.5 million. So how has it increased to 8.1? The estimate that we're looking at today is the most latest assessment of the figure work. Um, apologies, I don't have the detail here in terms of explaining how we've got from the, the lower figure you mentioned to that figure. But I can just um, 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 the figure that we've provided now in terms of the extent of the pressure for next year is the 8.1 million, um, and what that will cover is the um, 750 women per year to access the fertility treatment, um, including funding to extend the eligibility criteria. Um, and women in the 40 to 42 age group. Um, I'm happy to take that away to policy colleagues who are responsible for the area and the piece of work to try and distill out why th there's been that, that growth and that change in the figure work. There would appear to be a gap on Deputy Chair. I'm aware that you only asked one very brief question yes. to start, so I'll give you an <laughs> Thank indulgence. You. Roy. Thank you. Um, yeah, it would be great to get that clarification on those IVF figures, but it does seem quite a uh, large increase, but we expect it to be costly too. Um, in terms of workforce planning uh, and the cost and reliance of agency staff, uh, the Department is on record as stating that in 12 months to April 2019, the cost of temporary workers across the HSC um, totaled just over £200 million. Uh, the cost has increased year on year, rising from around £76 million in 2014-15. So I'm just really wondering about you can tell us more about progress on plans to reduce agency and local spending. Um, it's a separate policy area within the department has responsibility that in terms of the workforce strategy and all of the workforce planning. Um, and from, so it's not my policy area, but I could say from a general perspective, um, it's it's very much in connected with the work that's ongoing in terms of transforming the health service. Um, the workforce is a key element of that. And um, 
I know um, there's been a lot of work invested, a lot of time and money invested into that over the last couple of years, um, and that work absolutely needs to continue at pace to ensure that the, the, the level of sp expenditure absolutely comes down. Okay. And uh, in terms of transformation money, is there, can you give any assurance that money that's been allocated for transformation won't get sucked into the services uh, pot? The, the transformation money is very clearly ring fenced. So the money that we have this year, money we got last year, very much came associated with the ring fencing tag, if you want a better description. So it cannot be used for anything else that isn't transformative. So I think that's the absolute assurance that I can give to you. Um, and I hope that's sufficient. Yeah, that's I, I understand policy colleagues are coming to talk on transformation. I think it's possibly um, next week um, in terms of that programme of work. I know the briefing paper that you have certainly um, gives you a, a bit of a flavour of the types of things that we've been doing, the level of expenditure that we have incurred against the budget that we've been allocated in that space. Um, but they will be absolutely um, able to be, give you a little bit more colour and depth um, to that. That's great, thank you. Given that the department has a, an onus now to co-produce and uh, co-design services, what co-production or consultation has been done in relation to these figures and how they've been allocated? Um, in terms of 2021, the budget figures, they, they, they have really been... Um, part of our financial planning work and our, our normal processes. We've worked very closely with predominantly Health and Social Care Board colleagues. We in turn have worked very closely particularly with Health and Social Care Trusts colleagues, both in, in terms of finance and in terms of commissioning. So that would very much feed into the, the, the work that we do and the figure work that we have here today in, in terms of that. Um, you know, we have also um, engaged closely with, with our other arm's length bodies as well, um, outside of the, the trusts, as you would expect, in terms of understanding their pressures and um, factoring in in that co-produced way, very much taking on board their um, scale of their financial pressures, where they've got particular pressure points and where we can help address that in terms of securing additional budget cover. Or indeed, where they may be able to suggest improvements that, were they properly resourced, could could lead to stabilisation or indeed re reduction. So I think that's crucial that there is more of an engagement with, and there are a number of project boards with curers, and I I think it's crucial that that comes into the figures because if it's not resourced, the chances are it won't it won't happen. So listen. Thank you for the presentation. I think, I think it's safe to say this is only going to be the first of what's probably going to be a very much an ongoing. I think there are issues here around how opaque the figures are, how hard it is to drill down into where they're at. Many of us have been probably dealing with issues like uh, across several trusts where um, learning disability budgets have been underspent year on year on year. So obviously there are issues with how the systems are talking to each other. If money is assessed as being needed within a trust and within a directorate in a trust, that money should be going to the people that it was allocated for. So I think we'll probably be coming back. We would like to see a, a much greater breakdown in terms of these figures so we can understand what services the figures are going into. But thank you very much for your presentation today, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
And I think it's I think it's important to state that we have a number of very very strongly developed cross border services. We're working with the North West Cancer Centre. We have paediatric cardiology. The minister is actively working on paediatric pathology, which is a hugely sensitive issue again. So I think that 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 is the spirit in which we need to be advising the department that, that this type of legislation needs to be very well considered and uh, statutory regulations should be brought to us in that in that spirit. So I'm moving on then to as the committee has agreed to table a prayer of annulment, I will sign the motion to go to the business committee who will schedule it for debate. Should the department revoke the regulation in the meantime, we can advise the business committee and or not move the motion as required. Turning then to correspondence, may I refer the members to pages 57 to 79 of the pack and to the table papers. There are 12 items of correspondence in the pack and two in the table papers. So can I draw the members' attention to several items? Item 8.2 at page 60 of the pack is a response to the committee's request for further information on the consultation carried out in relation to substances recommended for control. Are members content to note that? Content. Item 8.11 at page 76 is a request from the committee for finance. Are members content that we forward information relating to budget scrutiny? Content. Item 8.13 at page 8 in table papers is a departmental response to the committee's request for information on the independent neurology inquiry and RQIA reviews. Do members wish to invite the chair of the independent neurology inquiry to brief us on processes and timelines? Yes. Just, just for noting, um, those of us who were meeting with them informally, the health spokespersons, we got correspondence yesterday to say that they were ceasing. That's why I was actually concerned that we were going to have that information vacuum now, so I would very much strongly support this. OK. Thank you. And do members also wish to invite RQAA to brief us on those range of inquiries that they're involved with? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Sorry, I would have any indication when that would be, do we? We don't have any... Um, do we have a date? It's in forward planning, is it? Forward planning, okay. We, we come back to you. Yeah, on that. Thanks. We'll have to tie, tie, tally it all together and bring it back. Item 8.14 at page 15 in table papers is a request from a representative of the Dunmurray Manor Support Group to address the committee. Um, so that obviously will be, in terms of the committee, will be related to overall issues of adult social care. Um, Many of many issues of which were identified in relation to Dunmurray Manor, but we obviously wouldn't be dealing with specifically Dunmurray Manor. I do think, however, that there there is a broader issue here. We have already received a request from the Commissioner for Older People, um, and we are aware that there is a, an independent review being taken place by CPEA. So it might be an idea for us to explore tallying all of those elements together and doing a session around that and kind of deciding how we how we schedule that so we get the most out of the information. Would that make sense? Just quickly, Chair, I think that would be useful. And I, I, I spoke to that group, and I think you met have previously, I think, as well, yeah. and they're quite over the detail and you know the enhancements and improvements that RQIA and the Department of Health can can do. So I think it would be useful for the committee as well, Chair. Yeah, yeah I, and I have spoke to him, and I have spoke also with, with uh, NI Patient Voice, who have been involved in, in some of the other um, issues around right around the north in terms of adult social care concerns and potential improvements so um, and there may potentially would need to consider as well the ombudsman has been involved so there may be some role for the ombudsman in terms of addressing the committee as well so i think we'll do a piece of work around just pulling that all together how how we best coordinate that yeah, Chair, can I just suggest, because um, and as I have previously about having the Commissioner here, because I know his recommendations, um, while it's triggered by Dunmurray Care, Dunmurray Manor, sorry, um, are not specific to it. It's very wide ranging, good practice. Yeah. And I think for us as a committee to be ahead of this, it would be worthy still considering him at an early point and then looking to see how we can. T and I know it was included in forward work. So. And it's, it's in and forward work there yeah, on so, 26th of March. So yeah, so it's just trying to get the order right yeah. in terms of us being best informed, you know, yeah. going forward. Appreciate it. So the proposal is that we go ahead yeah. with, with, with the Commissioner on that date and we consider yeah. how best we plan, plan all the other elements yeah, on it. Yeah. The members agreed with that approach? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, are members otherwise content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo at pages 58 and 59 of the pack? Uh, forward work programme, then. Can I refer you all to the draft forward work programme in table papers at pages 81 to 82 of the pack? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Um, I was just I was speaking to some of the representatives from the allied health professionals there during the coffee break, as were others, and I think that it would be, um, given the transformation agenda and the role for the MPTs, um, I think it would be um, a good idea to invite the new, newly appointed chief allied health professional in the Department of um, Health to come and present to us around what, they, what she sees as the um, priorities going forward. Are the members feel about that proposal? Yeah. 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 Chair, could I just also add, because uh, you know we are all coming across very valid reasons, and um, and I know that there's maybe um, there's timely value in bringing th- things to committee now rather than us waiting for a day where we sit down and properly consider the forward uh, work plan. So, in terms of um, process, is it still okay ahead? Of us sitting down to do a forward work that we do <coughs> just through that nature, bring things to committee. Well, I think regard, to committee have... for consideration. Yeah. Uh, ideally, if people if people are aware that there's a number of things, they can have a discussion about that or bring it up in any other business. But oh, yeah. I think I think uh, we do need to, I suppose, as quickly as possible, get a strategic yes. framework around around what we're doing. <coughs> and if we keep feeding too many things in, we're going to never get that sort of strategic approach to it. Yeah, because I'm very think conscious of the sure, yeah, of the short term left for this committee yeah. and the time pressure that we'll have. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think I think I think it's appropriate appropriate to raise them, and yeah. the committee then can discuss them. People okay. may have different views, yeah. but we, let, let's raise them and see how we how we. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, so just to take that forward very quickly, I wonder should we, um, if we have any others, then even feed them through to Elish through the, the clerk in the meantime, so that you can sort of collate them, so that we can actually review mm-hmm. them because it'll not be long coming to the forward work planning day. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then we're then moving to any other business, which I feel we've already partially moved to. But <laughs> anyway, do members have any other business they wish to raise? Sure, it just occurred to me, and um, the the um, our prayer of amendment. It, it might be because that is such a, a weighty and important piece of legislation that will come through this committee, you know, in the weeks and months ahead. And um, it might be worth asking that the department give us a continual feed on where they are in terms of developing that new piece of legislation. No doubt that they will try and draft so it doesn't arrive at us in one block. Well, I'm not, I'm not clear that there will be a need for new legislation. Yeah. A, a withdrawal agreement, a, a withdrawal deal yeah. may deal with the issues and there may not be any need to, okay. to, to legislate. So I think that will be the order that we, yeah. we would need to, if, if, there is, if there's going to be legislation necessary, yes. that they include the committee at the earliest stage yes. through mm-hmm. the appropriate channels. Yes, I suppose that's what I'm asking, an yeah. assurance that that is the case. Yeah, that, yeah. that they don't so come the, as, yeah. as, as, as last minute. That, mm-hmm. I think that's fair. Yeah. That, yeah. I think that, that should absolutely be the case. Yeah. Um, but I think the withdrawal agreement has acknowledged that there are particular circumstances here yeah. and you would hope that the, the further the further deal that's to be struck yes. within eleven months, if if that's possible, that that would then hopefully deal with the exact. issues. Yeah. But if it doesn't, then yeah. I think it's fair that the department yeah. would engage. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think just worth reminding that the committee did agree recently that it would like to put a Brexit briefing on their forward work programme yeah. shortly after yeah. Easter, so that'll give us a start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other items of business <laughs> for today? Mm-hmm. No. Okay, so just the date, time and place of next meeting then. The, meeting, the next meeting will take place at 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, 20th of February, 2020, in the Senate Chamber here in Parliament Building. I'm signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.